Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland. This is relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes and please subscribe to this podcast. Or if you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe to YouTube because I post all of my podcasts onto YouTube as well. So today's recording is going to be called You Are Not Broken. You Are Not Broken. That's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name it twice, it's just gonna be you are not broken. So it's kind of self explanatory in the sense of what I'm gonna talk about. And the reason why I give the these recordings I try and give them titles now. You know, put a little title in the uh, you know, just to make it easier for people to find. Uh, because someone contacted me a couple of weeks back and said, oh, you did a recording, um, but I can't remember which number it was, because I've done, I think I've done 91 of these specific recordings on this podcast. I've also added a few others that I thought would be beneficial um, for people listening. Um so, but so I had to listen to a few of my recordings to find the one that the lady had was sort of asking about. So I've tried to start putting a little brief title, which will hopefully help people to find the recordings if you know if it's something that you find useful. Also, you can download and stream all of my recordings on my website. I'm talking about all of them, not just this podcast, but there's over a thousand recordings uh, spanning back 14 years. Uh, And I've got other podcasts that I do currently pretty much every day. Uh, Let Me Bore You to Sleep podcast. That's generally daily now. I don't know how it just developed into that. That's about an hour of me talking complete nonsense. Just, just boring stuff for an hour. Uh, the other one is deep sleep whisper hypnosis, where I whisper for about twenty minutes, and it's sleep orientated. Also got a sleep hypnosis weekly, where the recording is a little bit longer, maybe half an hour, forty minutes, fifty minutes sometimes, and that's once a week, plus a few other podcasts. But it's all on my website anyway. So, you are not broken. So I want you to say that to yourself. You say it out loud, I'm not going to hear it. You might be at work or, you know, you might be having your lunch listening to this, for example, you know, but maybe not say it out loud if you're sitting on a train or bus or something. But it's up to you. You can. But just say it to yourself, whether internally or externally. I, the words, I am not broken. Those exact words, I am not broken. Put emphasis on the not. I, or I'm not broken. So let's uh, get rid of the am bit. I'm not broken. I'm not broken. How does it feel? Does it jar you? Does it does it feel wrong? Does it feel does it feel false? Does it feel like you're just lying to yourself? Does it feel incongruent or I whatever the word is, uncongruent, incongruent? Does it feel does it feel like you're just bullshitting yourself? 
because it might do because you might actually really believe that you're broken so that's what this recording is about because at the end of this recording you are going to be convinced <laughs> I'm going to convince you I'm going to hypnotise you into believing the fact that you're not broken that you're not perfect either none of us are doesn't mean that we don't need maintenance we all need maintenance bridges need maintenance you see someone maintaining a bridge but you know working on a bridge doesn't mean the bridge is broken you work on your house you maintain your house you haven't got to move out of your house while you're doing it the house isn't broken you're maintaining it you're keeping it going you're fixing things that need fixing it's very rare when the whole house just collapses of course it, it happens but it's rare but even in the most extreme situations let's say someone's had a complete mental breakdown and they're hospitalised they're still not broken and you may say well, of course they are they must be if they're, if they're unable to function but they're not broken they're not if they were broken they'd be dead that's broken that's, that's death broken when nothing works When that person that's going through an illness, going through really, you know, serious, serious illness, they're not broken. They're ill. Parts of them need to recover. Parts of them may not be working properly. But they're not broken. Their heart's still beating. Their brain's still working the lungs, the liver, the kidney, and maybe one of those isn't working properly, but the other parts are working. Someone that's in a wheelchair is not broken. You know, if someone's just walking, able to walk, have an accident, I guess we all know someone in this situation. It might be someone listening right now. I've got a good friend who jumped off a, off a cliff when he was like, 18 or 19 ended up paralysed from his waist down he believed he was broken and he had a broken back and then it healed but he's been in a wheelchair for ever since but for about two years he believed he was broken but he wasn't his heart still beats his lungs still worked He just couldn't move his legs. I don't mean just couldn't move his legs as in a dismissive way. But he could move his arms. He could move his shoulders. He could move his neck. He could talk. He could see. He could hear. He could have all the emotions that anybody else could have. And he wasn't broken. But he believed that he was. And I think when it comes to mental health issues, I never know what, how, what to call it anymore. So like, you can't sort of, can't call it mental illness anymore because people don't like to, it to be called that, even though it's an illness, different levels of illness. But now, in my country, everyone seems to call it mental health. I like to add the word issues at the end because physical health, someone says, like, I've got physical health. They're basically saying, I'm feeling well. Yet if you say, I've got mental health, it's, 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 it's a weird kind of terminology that's been taken up. But anyone, let's say, with anxiety, depression, panic issues, stress, 
may think that they're broken because for some reason whatever's going on in their life or your life, my life we're not functioning in the same way as we once were we're maybe struggling with some things that used to be really easy to us that were second nature we didn't even give it didn't have to give it any thought we just did it but you know what what I noticed with the anxiety the extreme anxiety I got was it may it, it kind of caused me to it seemed to cause me to be more sensitive it was almost like I was noticing things I almost felt like my skin a layer of my skin had been peeled off so I was more I wasn't quite as uh, rough um, with things you know I was a bit more careful maybe not physically but just emotionally maybe just a little bit noticing things because if you had a layer of skin taken off or let's say if you've had a burn a mild burn even on your hand you notice the sensitivity when you wash your hands when that bit of skin scrapes up against even just uh, your trousers you know you just notice it and it might not even be it might not even be like a, a, a proper burn it might not have blistered it might just be a mild discomfort that you don't even notice until it kind of scratches against something but the rest of your body you wouldn't even notice it in some ways it felt a little bit like as far as stress levels went that I had a callus that my stress levels the anxiety levels were all kind of contained within a callus and I wasn't a nothing could trigger it like I could take huge amounts of stress the reality I couldn't but for some reason I managed to develop that callus in some circumstances for example working working long hours doing a stressful job living unhealthily drinking excessively and being depressed really without even acknowledging it so I was the callus was protecting me from the pain I wasn't feeling it it was, it was just it was protecting me from feeling it because not not all emotions are pain but if you get to the point where you don't feel anything because if you're a guitar player um, I've learned to play the guitar a few times or attempted and I ended up with calluses on my left fingers um, so you could stroke it and it just has no feeling really so you don't feel pain but you don't feel any pleasure either and my hands are quite sensitive I don't know maybe everyone's is I don't know but I quite like stroking my palms and my hands the tops of my fingers because they're quite sensitive I don't spend all day doing it I'm just saying it's quite a nice thing to do but if I had a callus on there I wouldn't be able to feel I might feel it but it wouldn't be sensitive so I could scrape it and not have any kind of discomfort which is what calluses are sort of built for aren't they to sort of protect you from discomfort and pain the thing is with the callus it also protects you from well not protect you it prevents you from feeling pleasure so if you push this to the extreme which I kind of like to do but if you was thinking of 
if you thought of a particular part of your body which is sensitive so I'm just saying as an example I'm not going to go into graphic details if that part of your body had a callus on it it would mean that it couldn't it, you know it's going to be protected it's not you know it's very unlikely to get hurt because it's going to be protected a layer of like tough skin would be over it protecting that part so you know if you bashed it or whatever it wouldn't hurt but at the same time there'd be no pleasure so I think that's what maybe we build which allows the stress levels to raise so high because you don't notice the stress levels rising and then suddenly maybe that anxiety attack or that stress level gets too high and the callus just drops off because even the callus can't handle it it's almost like uh, a fizzy drink you know shake a fizzy drink and then uh, take the lid off and it just squirts everywhere because of the pressure the thing is that fizziness and that pressure only lasts while the lid's on once the lid's off it releases and that energy's gone but you don't look at the bottle of coke and think it's broken you might think oh it's all sticky and look what a mess I've made everywhere I have to wash my hands or wash the bottle but the bottle of coke or lemonade or whatever it is beer or whatever it is you're drinking it's not broken the contents aren't broken there may be less content in there because of the overflow but just like if you've got a small child or a family member someone that you love dearly they go to hospital and they get told that they've got a you know they've got something serious that they have to have medication for and you know something uh, long term condition you don't just say oh they're broken we can you know, chuck them out not, we're not taking them home you can keep them in the hospital and uh, yeah we do, they're broken you wouldn't say that would you so why, why, why would you say it about yourself why would you call yourself broken we're not you're not broken you're not broken and I don't care if it's annoying hearing it you can get as annoyed as you want hearing me say you're not broken but you know what even if you stop the recording now that's going to play in your mind you're just going to keep hearing I'm not broken and you know what there's worse things that could play in your mind there's worse things that you can play over and think of because it's a really positive thing to be reminded of so you know if I say to you you're a wonderful person and I don't care how annoyed you get if I say that to you and I can keep going on and on about it for 45, 50 minutes and anyone that's listened to me knows that I can keep going on that will stick it will stick and it has a positive effect and if you was going to actually if you were really going to kind of sum up hypnosis my understanding of hypnosis is it's an idea that sticks it's an idea that sticks in your mind and that idea transforms the way you think the way you act the way you behave transforms your life possibly 
maybe only in a small way. It doesn't have to be in a big way, does it? If you get appendicitis, please don't, but I'm saying I've, I've had my appendix out. And my brother had appendicitis and, you know, so it's, I guess it's a gene genetic thing, I don't know. But um, that appendicitis, right, that pain affects your whole body. It's trauma, it's absolute agony, all that stuff. Well, you know, it can be. If you catch it in time, it can just be discomfort and you, you know, they take them out and you're fine which is hopefully what will happen. If it gets ignored, or they don't get it out, and it disrupts and, you know, it can cause complete havoc to the body, sepsis or whatever. The thing is, once it's removed, everything goes back to normal and carries on. That one tiny, and the appendix is, appendix is a tiny little part of your body. Tiny little part of your body. And it's removed. And it changes the whole dynamics of your body. Changes how you physically feel. And change, you know, because you haven't got that discomfort anymore. Because, you know, the way you walk, the way you sleep, everything's going to be affected by a physical issue. Perhaps. So when you make a small change, it changes everything else as well. It's a, the byproduct. The, it changes things. I mean, you know, if you've... I've worked in places... Lots of lots and lots of different places over the years. Had lots of jobs. You know, sometimes just one person leaving, you know, um, leaving the job, or just a new person starting, can transform the whole work environment in a way that's it can be really positive. It might not be, but it can really change the environment in a real obvious way very quickly so you change a small thing it can change the big thing you know you think if you've got a if you've got a roof well we've all got roofs haven't we I suppose but if you've, if you've got a roof and you're living in a house and you just drill a hole in the roof above your bed you might not even notice it at first but eventually you'll notice it because you start getting wet because it'll start dripping the rain will drip on you and maybe birds will start flying in who knows what's going to happen so And you think the whole of the house, you know, you've got all those, I don't know how many thousands of bricks go into a house and, you know, all the, you might have five rooms, six rooms, staircase, but just that one hole that going through the roof, I'm, I'm, I imagine you haven't got a loft, I'm just saying if the roof is there just above your bedroom so you can get straight to the uh, outside just for the argument's sake of the story. That one hole will transform the house for you. But not if you're in a different room. So one thing could have a difference, it can make a difference. So you're not broken. You are not broken. It should be a song. I'm not going to make it that way. I'm not going to start singing. But you're not broken. So how do you get your head? How do you get your head around that fact? Because 
maybe, I mean, I know I, I like to feel sorry for myself at times. Um, I've done it for years and years. On Not the whole time, but, you know, every now and then. Like, oh, woe is me. No one has it as hard as me. No one's ever had anxiety like I've had it. No one's ever felt as stressed or as, you know depressed as me, me, me. No one had, I had the worst childhood of anyone in the whole world and all that is bullshit there's no way of knowing you can't we can't compare each other's um, conditions or issues or childhoods or suffering or anything like that because you know ultimately regardless of what's happened in my life I've not grown up in extreme poverty and starvation being held by a mother who hasn't eaten for two weeks and I'm just skin and bone you know I, I didn't live I've not lived like that so I haven't had it worst but at the same time I don't want to dismiss what I've been through I don't want to dismiss it like saying well it doesn't matter because other people have had it worse so it's about for me it's, it's about valuing yourself not comparing yourself to other people but realising what's happened in your life has affected you but it's also made you the person you are you know the kindness in your heart is there because of all the things that have happened in your life not just because of the good things and the nice things maybe that kindness wanting to help other people could be because you weren't able to help other people at one point in your life or maybe because someone else has helped you when you didn't feel worth anything you didn't feel that you deserved to be helped but someone helped you anyway someone that actually ended up hurting you may have helped you so there's that kind of contradiction of like well they really helped me and then they you know then they ran off and stole everything or they whatever it could be a horrible story but actually it doesn't take away the fact that they did help you at some point there's a whole mentality isn't it of uh, when people get divorced saying well I've just, I've just wasted the last 14 years of my life that's the same mentality as, as I'm broken it's illogical it's an emotional response I've wasted 14 years of my life well, you could say well how long has it been unhappy well for the last three so you had 11 years that wasn't wasted then you know it's like it's like, remember I, was, I remember reading years ago the idea is you had the most amazing date go out have a wonderful time maybe you go to the theatre maybe you go to a comedy club whatever it is you love doing and you go to a restaurant and you have the most amazing meal and you just basically so in love with the person that you're seeing opposite you know you both really loved up and it's beautiful and then the, the waiter trips and spills wine over you or over your partner and, and then you, someone might say that's it it's ruined the evening isn't that ridiculous why would you discount all of that pleasure just because someone spilled wine on you? 
I mean, admit, yeah, if it was a car crash with a fatality, yeah, at, at sport the evening, of course. You know, that's an extreme situation. Or if something really bad happens, yeah, but someone spilling wine, it's annoying. It might mean you have to go home early, but it doesn't discount all the lovely time you've had with that person. So why is it the? It's almost like we're we're wired or not wired but taught to behave in that way and to think that way. Maybe it's just it gets passed down. Parents pass it down. They've been passed down from their parents to have that negative mentality of, "Oh, that's all sport now." When actually, why? No, it's not. There's that mentality, that idea, I'm broken, because not everything is working perfectly. You're not broken. Even if you're listening to this and you're in a psychiatric ward somewhere, you're not broken. You will get better, you will recover. And recovery doesn't mean being perfect. If someone with a, a condition, recovering doesn't mean having everything gone. I got bipolar. Recovery is it's a condition, it's a lifelong well, I've always had it really. But there's a big difference between how I am now and how I have been. So in a way that is a recovery. Which means I'm not broken. Because whenever we'll recover recovery is an option. It isn't fixing it. Recovery isn't fixing. Because then there's a problem. You had you're making it a problem. Problems need to be fixed. The only things that need to be fixed is broken things. Problems need solutions. And then there's that idea of treating yourself the way you would treat someone else. Not my idea. Pretty good idea though, I think. Providing you've got some kindness towards yourself. Because if someone really dislikes himself and constantly telling themselves how horrible they are and how whatever then treating other people the way you treat yourself might not be a good idea so maybe treating yourself how you treat other people if you're treating them nicely that's kind of the little catch on that one that's why I seem to aim that you know, the idea of would you say that to a small child? Because even in my worst, my worst mental states of anger or whatever, I would never be nasty to a child. You know, I just, it's just, it's something I couldn't do. I couldn't be verbally, I don't know, really verbally abusive to anyone, but I wouldn't, I just couldn't. Or to an elderly person. So we all know how to behave. <laughs> I know people try and pretend they don't, but they we all do. We all know how to behave. We all know how we don't need to be taught it. Not really. I must may I don't know, maybe we do, but if you're an adult and you listen to this, you don't need to be taught how to behave. We all know how to be nice to somebody. It's really easy. But being nice to yourself doesn't seem to come as naturally. And I don't think we're taught that. We're taught manners. And it depends on what country you're from. The, um, the manners may change. It, you know, we've all got our own customs haven't we in different countries uh, some 
I don't know, I, I'm not sure what all of them are, and I don't really care. But, you know, different things like bowing and shaking hands and some things are classed as an insult in some countries and their classes as maybe a, a compliment in other countries. As I said, I don't care about that stuff. But we're taught that. That's taught. No one's born thinking I should bow. I should bow to my elders or I should... Uh, shake someone's hand or I should say please thank you you know we're not born with those things you know if we were just left alone we're born we eat when we want to eat we start eating when we want to start eating and then ultimately we just go to the toilet wherever we wanted to go you know we have to be taught what to do with that stuff but no one teaches us how to be kind to ourselves. No one teaches us to have manners towards ourselves. And I say no one. Maybe, maybe you have had people do that, but I never have. Not like during school. Not during my childhood. Not you know. I know that some. There are some practices that can teach you to be kind to yourself. Of course there are. There's lots of things out there that can uh, encourage you and to develop that loving kindness towards yourself and towards others also. But it's not something that's, I don't think, it's generally taught to people as they're growing up. To actually be nice to yourself. To show yourself manners, you know? To say thank you to yourself. To recognise your accomplishments and your successes. And to actually be your own cheerleader. If you haven't got an internal cheerleader, you should get one. You need to be your own supporter. You know, get on your own side. Support yourself. You know, cheer yourself on. It might seem ridiculous to hear that, but if you give it a little bit of thought, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you went and watched your a friend playing football, or a sport or anything or you could watch your kid or anyone that you know you go and watch them in a a competitive situation whatever that might be rugby, tennis, badminton whatever it is, snooker you're going to be cheering them on and you might not know anything about the sport but you're going to be so you might not know the, anything about the competitor that your friend or the person that you know is playing against. But you're excited because you want your person to win. And there's an excitement there that I've had in the past. And, and I was surprised at it. Because I went to see someone doing something and it was a competitive environment. I got really excited and I'm not a sports person I'm not really into sports like to like I mean and as, as an audience apart from boxing and you know if I if you were my friend and you was you was in a boxing match I came and saw you I would be more excited seeing you in the ring and I'd be than I would of any other fight I've ever seen in my life like on TV because I'd be it'd be the cheer I'd almost be in the ring with you kind of what you're egging you on to be successful or if it was a pie-eating contest whatever it was you were doing or running you know doing a marathon or it doesn't matter what it is whether it's a rehabilitation and you know you're learning to walk again and I'm sort of there with you and I'm like I'm going to be egging you on. I was like, 
as your cheerleader. You need to have that in your own head. You need to be your own cheerleader. Because the energy that produces, the positive energy, I can feel it just talking about it. Maybe you can feel it hearing it. The idea of it is powerful. Which means you're not broken. Because as long as you've got that cheerleader in your head, it won't let you be broken. It won't let you feel broken. It won't let you say to yourself that you're broken. Because it never gives up. A cheerleader never, ever, ever quits. Doesn't mean that you've got to keep going. But the cheerleader won't ever stop cheering you on. So you might be running, the cheerleader will be saying, yeah, keep running, keep running. But you stop running and you say, I've got to sit down. Your cheerleader, cheerleader can say, yeah, sit down, that's it, sit down, get some rest, get some oxygen into your lungs, have some water. And you might say, oh, I'm completely knackered, I can't, I don't want to go on anymore because I don't feel very well or my legs hurt. That's great. Um, rest, go home, you know, celebrate, you've done you've done half of the marathon, you know, you did your best. You know, the cheerleader doesn't have to be, doesn't just have to be um, cheering you on when things are going well, like perfect, however often that is, but you also cheer you on to feel okay within yourself when things aren't going perhaps so well. to let you know, sort of if there's an anxiety moment, a cheerleader can remind you, you're gonna be okay. This is a temporary thing, you're gonna be all right. Or, I'm gonna be all right. It doesn't have to be in a third person, it could be, I'm gonna be all right, to remind you that you're gonna be okay. It's a temporary, physical feeling or emotional feeling or both that you're experiencing in that moment you're not broken because you can check can you move your leg can you move your hand move parts of your body that are fine normally yeah you can move them can you still see can you still hear can you move your tongue Yeah, so you're not broken. If you can move one thing, and I'm saying this to people that are able-bodied, of course if someone's completely paralysed, that's, you know, I realise some people might be listening who are, and I don't mean any dis disrespect when I'm talking about moving a part of your body, and I'm sure you understand that. But even if it's just blinking your eyes, or closing your mouth, opening, it means you're not broken. And you may say, oh, it's easy for you to say you're physically able or whatever. But I'm not talking about physical issues. I'm talking about from an emotional perspective. I'm talking about from a stress, anxiety, um, that perspective. From a positivity perspective moving from negativity to positivity because you don't have negative cheerleaders Can you imagine that, a negative cheerleader at a, a basketball game or a football game just you know all these people just doing run doing little dances saying you're crap your shit your rubbish you're... which is kind of some of the stuff that we might say to ourselves can you imagine that? I'm guessing they wouldn't keep their jobs because I'm, I'm aware that cheerleading is a professional job for a lot of people. They get paid, it's a career. It's not always just something at school or you know, a hobby. It's, people do that as a job, as a career. It's what they love. Now, in America, some cheerleaders, they'll travel the country. 
you know they do, you know it's, it's important thing it's it's a very positive thing so you could say to yourself well, what kind of cheerleader would you want to be to somebody else so you think of someone in your life that is going through it they're suffering they're unhappy maybe they're physically ill whatever whatever's going on with them what kind of a cheerleader would you like to be inside their head what kind of things would you like to tell them you know if you could take over the cheerleader role so it would be part of them so it would be talking to them as it is them you know it's like it's not not uh, Bob you are great but I am great or I am able to deal with this this you know as a, as a first person thing and when you think about that how would you like to be a cheerleader for someone else then maybe think oh, how would you like your inner cheerleader to be and maybe develop that idea and I realise I perhaps should call this cheerleader be the title of this recording but it all fits in with you're not broken you're not broken and I just wonder what it feels like if you say to yourself now I'm not broken just say it to yourself three times I'm not broken three times how do you feel how do you feel different from how you felt at the beginning of this recording when I asked you to do that notice the difference in energy notice how things feel changed they're changed things things are always changing and that phrase I am or I'm not broken I'm not broken you could flip it I'm okay or I'm going to be okay or I'm going to be better or I'm going to improve or maybe all of those and I think it's important to really get it it's good to go from a positive it's good to like phrase things in a positive but sometimes I think it's also useful to remember what the negative was that you were thinking because the thought of uh, someone thinking that they're broken is such an extreme, limiting, horrible thought, very damaging, um, it's nasty, isn't it? It's a nasty way to think about yourself. It's almost cruel. It's almost kind of giving up and that's something you should never do ever 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 that's why the cheerleaders inside you because it doesn't matter what you do you're not giving up and not giving up doesn't mean continuing to run when you can't breathe any longer and you can't your legs aren't working that's not giving up sitting down and having a break is not giving up. 
even though some people say oh, he's given up he's sitting down now he's drinking water he's lying on the floor resting he didn't finish the race therefore he quit no it's not giving up that's stopping doing that particular activity it's not giving up And that inner cheerleader won't let you give up ever because it will cheer you on no matter what you do because it accepts you, it loves you. It's your cheerleader. It reminds you constantly that you are not broken. It's the antidote to that thought that you may used to have, you know. It's the antidote. It gets rid of it constantly reminding you and telling you that you're not broken reminding you by cheering you on with whatever you're doing so whether you're staying in bed all day because you can't face going out or doing anything your cheerleader can say, well, you're getting some rest. And keeping that positivity up, reminding you that tomorrow's another day. And you're choosing to be in bed. You don't have to do anything. It's a choice. Which means tomorrow, or in an hour's time, you can get out of bed. If you want to have a bath or a shower, or not have a bath and a shower, or you know, maybe not both, but you know, whatever you choose, your cheerleader can be behind you, reminding you that you're not broke. You're not broken. You don't need fixing because you're not broken. Changes may be required but I would suggest that changes are required for every single person on the planet we all need things to be a little bit different we all need to make changes in our life if we want to progress emotionally spiritually, mentally, physically whatever or if we want to just delay deterioration physical deterioration with age maybe we need to start doing more walking or going for I feel really old now as I talk about that but maybe you know as I'm getting older I might need to do more physical stuff to prevent my joints seizing up or you know that's okay it just means making changes I can't do backflips anymore tell you a secret though I never could but don't tell anyone you know it's it's okay but your inner cheerleader can say it's fine it's fine Why, wh whatever you do is okay we're on your side let's make it positive though it's going to be positive it's, you're going to want to want to be positive and do nice things for yourself be kind to yourself because that happens organically because when you stop when you stop that train of thought of uh, negativity towards yourself and I'm no good at this and I'm crap at this and uh, I'm broken and all that stuff it gets in the way of that natural flow of creativity and feeling you know the opportunity to feel happy and to actually get in touch with gratitude and to be able to forgive others and yourself so that cheerleader can remind you keep you going even if it is something like just getting some food go on that's really good and get the get the toast that's it put the put the frozen bread in the toaster 
Go and get the butter from the fridge. Go and get some cheese. Hey, that's really good. What do you do there? Make that cheese really, really sliced thin. And I say, yeah, we'll actually boil it in slices. Oh, well, don't matter. That's, that's a really good idea. Why not tell yourself that you're doing really well? Why not? When have we ever had that? Other than maybe when we was very tiny. Possibly a lot of small children get told how wonderful they're doing all the time. When it comes to like potty training, eating with a knife and fork. Oh, what a good boy, old oh, Jason, you done a, you managed to do a poo and you did it in a, you didn't do it on a carpet this time. Yay. It's just, you know, you get a lot of positive reinforcement. But for some reason, that kind of seems to subside somewhat with age. So we need to keep it going in our head. We need to have our own reinforcement, positive reinforcement. So before I go, I just want you to say the words again in your head. I'm not broken. Just say it three times. And just do it slowly. Say it really slowly. Like, I'm not broken. And just do it three times and notice how you feel. Notice how you physically feel. If you're still doing it, I apologise. You're doing it much slower than I thought. I thought I should have enough time, but if you're still doing it, it doesn't matter. I can interrupt. So I want you to. What I want you to do now is, I want you to say the words "I'm not broken" twice. But I want you to do it in a really annoying, high-pitched voice. It could be something like Mickey Mouse. It could be any silly voice that you can imagine. And just say it, it could be a Muppet, whatever. So do, do if you do that now, just say it twice, I'm not broken, but instead of that, it's like, I'm not broken. You know, that's an example. So you do that now. So I guess it's, it feels probably a bit silly. Now, what you could do now is make a, an accent. Put a silly make-believe accent on. Um, something that you like. And it could be an accent that you like. Uh, so you might be a fan of the Irish accent or French accent. Or maybe... Um, if you're in America, you might love the Canadian accent. I hear that you get on really well. So, you know, give that a go. <laughs> so, whatever accent you want, do it that. Do that twice, but, but exaggerate the accent. Make it ridiculous. If you do that now, do it twice. Just say, I'm stuck. I'm not going to do an accent, but I'll let you do yours. Um, but I'm not broken twice. Okay, so I just want you to just notice how it feels. What kind of energy you've got in your in your body and in your mind right now. And you know what I would do? If you was here right now and I had a group of people, I would, and this is something you can do, and I'll leave you on this note, on this idea. And you can do this if you want to do this, but you need your eyes open to do it. Um, and you need a bit of space. So you might need to do it in your garden or do it in your living room or I don't know. Unless, of course, you've got a dance studio available, which you possibly don't. Not everybody's got a dance studio. Um, but this literally is that. It's a case of dancing around 
you can shout at the top of your voice, I'm not broken. Of course, you don't have to dance. You can just do it. Go into a field. There's no one around. And shout at the top of your voice. Or you can sing. I'm not broken. You can just sing it. Or you can dance and sing it at the same time. Or dance and shout it at the same time. It doesn't have to be a professional performance, you know. Everybody can dance when there's no one looking. So give that a go. Play with it. Play with the idea, I'm not broken. I'm not broken. And you're not broken. And remember that. This is serious stuff, you know. Serious to remember that. And the thing is, you're not going to be able to forget because now that you've listened to me for an hour, rabbiting on about it, it's now stuck in your head. Sorry about that. There's very little that can be done now. So that that cheerleader in your brain is going to be there now, cheering you on, giving you positivity and love and reminding you that you're not broken. Just like my stomach reminding me that I need to eat something for some reason. So you take care of yourselves. I'm going to go. And if you do get a chance, do a little dance. Do do that and maybe let me know how you get on. So take care of yourselves. Thank you for listening. And remember, as always, to be kind to yourself you deserve to be happy and you're not broken lots of love bye